Please join me in welcoming Mi Young, who will in turn introduce her sister. Hi. What a room. Um, so the most special thing about me is that I'm Annie's friend and Minjin's sister. So at least for tonight, because depending on the audience, I'm, I'm totally flexible. I can be special for other reasons. Um, so Pachinko is my sister Minjin's second novel, for those of you that don't know. Um, her first novel, Free Food for Millionaires, is a story about immigrants uh, who are struggling to make a home for themselves in their adopted country. It's set in New York City in the 1990s and features a Korean, -American, Korean immigrant family who are trying to figure out how they fit in. It's a struggle that I think many of us in this room uh, know all too well, as well as the people whose stories are told about in this museum. Minjin's new novel, Pachinko, is also about immigrants who are struggling to make a home for themselves in their adopted country, but this time the story is set in Japan, and it's about four generations of a Korean family who are living there. My sister has received, and I have to now pick up the paper for this because the list is long. My sister has received much well-deserved accolades for her work. Uh, New York Times has called Free Food for Millionaires accomplished and engrossing and said that Pachinko is a stunning novel. Juno Diaz has called the book luminous and that it's a powerful meditation on what immigrants sacrifice to achieve a home in this world. And then he went on to say that the book confirms her place among the finest novelists. Pachinko is a national bestseller, a New York Times editor's choice, a top 10 books of the month for Amazon, and many, including BBC.com, Newsweek.com, Publishers Weekly, I'm a proud sister, bear with me, um, Esquire.com, LitHub, Chicago Review of Books, BuzzFeed, L.com, Daily Mail UK, Nylon, and so many more, have said that you should read her book. So if you haven't read her book, go read her book. Um, she was even on Leonard Lopate on NPR talking about Pachinko, and I'm a total NPR nerd, so that was really exciting when that happened. Um, and just today, The Guardian described the book as a vivid, immersive, multi-generational saga about life for Koreans in Japan, a tale of resilience and poignant emotional conflict that reads like a long, intimate hymn to the struggles of people in a foreign land. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. It was just today. So Min has done an incredible amount of historical research for this book, and it can be used as a history book, like a textbook in a classroom. But Pachinko is a story about love and disappointment, success and power, shame and guilt, and joy and sadness, and it deals with issues of race and class, and addresses problems confronting outsiders like immigrants and women, and deals with the tensions between parents and children. So it's a story about belonging and about identity and about resilience. And I think Pachinko is being so well re received because it speaks to all of us, especially at this time when the world seems so topsy-turvy. <laughs> Um, Pachinko's about life, and that's what I love about Min's books. In both the books, her characters, the immigrants or the others, do as the natives do. They love, they cheat, they sing, they dance, they do the little dance like this, like that little girl on the TV on BBC. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of it, and there's sex, and there's a lot of sex, much to my like horror. Um, and they suffer and they celebrate. Uh, and most of all, they survive and even thrive in the face of adversity. So as Lynn Manuel said, immigrants, we get the job done. And as my sister has always, always gotten the job done, she was always the one to quietly work away long into the night after I was fast asleep to get the job done and to do it really, really well. She was a debate champion in high school. She went on to write award-winning essays and stories in college. And as you may have read in many of the articles and stories that have been published about her since Pachinko hit the sands in February, she's not one to let anything get in the way of getting the job done. So in sickness or in health, whether it takes 100 or 1,000 interviews, Minjin will keep working away to get the history right, to get the sentence correct, and to make sure that you understand and feel what the characters are feeling. And in other words, to tell a great story. So she begins her book with this line, one of my favorite lines in any book ever, history has failed us, but no matter. The second part of that sentence, but no matter, captures so much of Min's spirit and the strength of her characters that stick with you long after you finish her books. And no matter what life is throwing at her or her characters, she will persevere. Or hashtag she persisted if you're live tweeting this event. So. <laughs> 
thank you. And I am so proud to introduce my sister, a best-selling author and one of the finest novelists, Minjin. Wow. I was over there, I didn't know. And you, you're, you're like when you're um, at doing these events, you're always privately like praying, like I hope somebody comes. <laughs> and then you kind of want to give every person a hug, saying like thank you for not watching Netflix. <laughs> thank you so much, especially back there because that's usually where I used to sit whenever I went to readings. Thank you. Um, I'm, thank you, Mia, and thank you, Annie, and thank you, Ken, who's hiding over there for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you for the folks who are doing all this hard work and everybody behind the counter. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, I am incredibly grateful. I'm going to read just a little bit. I read about six to seven minutes maximum usually of the book because I, I always want you to like me. <laughs> and you don't want that writer to just be like going on and on and on and on. So uh, I'm going to read actually kind of a fun scene. Uh, it's when Sanja, my main character, and her sister-in-law find out that they're in debt and they have to go to a pawnbroker. And I just should mention that I did a little research about pawnbroking, and I actually went to a pawnbroker, and I learned a lot of things. Anyway, I hope that it shows in this work. So my character Sanja is on the scene, and also um, her sister Kyung Hee is in this. Her sister-in-law Kyung Hee is in the scene, and I'm going to read to you now. Is uh, acoustics okay? You guys could hear. It? Okay. The sisters-in-law walked briskly toward the shopping street near Sudahashi Station, and they didn't linger in front of the fabric shop window or pause at the senbei stall. They didn't greet the friendly vegetable sellers. Rather, their bodies moved in unison toward their destination. I don't want you to do this, Kyung Hee said. Father told me that people like this if the entire debt isn't paid off immediately, the interest gets higher and higher and you'll never be able to pay it all back. Father said that you always end up owing so much more than you borrow. Think about it. How did 120 yen become 213? Her father, Huni Kim, had witnessed his neighbors lose everything after borrowing a small amount of money to buy seedlings or equipment when the money lenders were through with them, his neighbors would end up giving them all their crops on top of their initial loans. And Sanja's father had loathed money lenders and had warned her often about the dangers of debt. If I had known, I would have stopped sending money to my parents, Kyung Hee mumbled to herself. Sanja looked straight ahead avoiding eye contact with anyone on the busy street who glanced in their direction. She was trying to figure out what she would say to the broker. Sister, you said that the sign was in Korean, right? That would make him Korean, right? I, I don't know. I, I don't know anyone who's ever been there before. And following the Korean signs posted on the facade of the low brick building, the women climbed up the wide stairs to the second floor, and the pawnbroker's office door had a curtained window, and Sanja opened it gingerly. It was a warm, breezeless day in June, but the older man behind the desk wore a green silk ascot tucked into his white shirt and brown woolen vest. The three square windows facing the street were open, and the two electric fans whirred quietly in the opposite corners of the office and two younger men with similar chubby faces played cards by the middle window. And they glanced up, and they smiled at the two women. And the pawnbroker asked, welcome, how can I be of service? And his hometown Korean accent was very hard to place. Would you like to sit down? And he motioned to the chairs, and Sanja told him she would prefer to stand. And Kyung Hee stood next to Sanja, and she refused to look at them. And Sanja opened the palm of her hand to show him the pocket watch. Ajashi, how much could you give me for this? And the man raised his gray and black eyebrows, and he pulled out a loop from the desk drawer. 
Where did you get this? My mother gave it to me. It's solid silver and it's washed in gold. And she knows you're selling it. She gave it to me to sell for the baby. And wouldn't you prefer a loan for the watch? Maybe you don't want to let go of it. Loans were rarely repaid, and he'd be able to keep the collateral. And Sanja spoke slowly. I want to sell it. If you don't wish to buy it, I won't trouble you any longer, sir. And the broker smiled, wondering if the pregnant girl had already been to his competitors. There were three pawnbrokers just a few streets away, and none of the others were Korean. But if she spoke any Japanese, it would have been very easy to sell the watch. And the pretty woman accompanying the pregnant one before him looked a little Japanese in the way she dressed. It was hard to tell. It was possible that the pretty one had brought the pregnant girl to negotiate with him, and the watch belonged to her. Well, if you have a need to sell it, I always take pleasure helping someone from home. And Sanja said nothing. In the market, say very little her father had taught her. And Kyung Hee marveled at her sisters in law, appearing calmer than she had ever seen her before. And the pawnbroker examined the watch with care, opening its silver casing to study the mechanical workings visible through its open crystal back. It was an extraordinary pocket watch, and impossible to believe that this pregnant girl's mother could have owned such a thing. The watch was maybe a year old and without a scratch. And he turned it face up and laid it on the green leather blotter on his desk. Young men prefer wristwatches these days. I don't even know if I can sell it. And Sanja noticed that the broker had blinked very hard after saying this. But he hadn't blinked when he was talking to her before. Thank you for looking at it, sir. And Sanja turned around. And Kyung Hee was trying not to appear worried. And Sanja picked up the watch and gathered the tail end of her chima, preparing to walk out of the office. We, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you. I'd like to help you. And Sanja turned around. If you need the money right away, perhaps it would be easier for you to sell it to me than walking around here on this hot day in your condition. I can help you. It looks like you'll have the child soon, and I hope it's a boy who will take good care of his mother. 50 yen, he offered. 200. It's worth at least 300. It's made in Switzerland, and it's brand new. And the two men by the window put down their cards and got up from their seats. They had never seen a girl talk like this before. Well, if you think it's worth so much, then why don't you sell it at a higher price somewhere else? And the broker was irritated by her insolence. He couldn't stand women who talk back. And Sanja bit her inner lip. If she sold it to her Japanese pawnbroker, then Sanja feared that the broker may alert the police about the watch. And Hansu had told her that the police were involved in every business transaction here. Thank you, sir. Um, I won't waste any more of your time. And Sanja turned around. And the pawnbroker chuckled. And Kyung Hee suddenly felt confident of her sister-in-law, who had been so helpless upon her arrival in Osaka that she had to carry her name and her address written on a card in Japanese in case she got lost. What did your mother do back home? The pawnbroker asked. You sound like you're from Busan. And Sanja paused, wondering if she had to answer the question. Did your mother work in the markets there? She's a boarding housekeeper. Hmm, she must be a very clever businesswoman. And the broker had figured that her mother must have been a whore, 
or a merchant of some sort who collaborated with the Japanese, the watch could have also been stolen. And from her speech and dress, the pregnant girl was not from a wealthy family. Young lady, you're sure that your mother gave this to you to sell. You are aware that I need your name and your address in case there's any trouble. And Sanja nodded. OK, then. 125 yen. 200. <laughs> Sanja didn't know if she would get this amount, but she felt certain that the broker was a greedy man. And if he was willing to go to 125 from 50, then surely the Japanese brokers would think he was valuable too. And the broker burst out laughing. And the young men were now standing by the desk, and they laughed as well. And the younger one said, you should work here. <laughs> and the broker folded his arms close to his chest. He wanted the watch, and he knew exactly who would buy it. Father, you should give the little mother her price, if only because she's so persistent. The younger one said, knowing that his father didn't like to lose a bargain and he would need some coaxing. And he felt sorry for the girl with a puffy face. She wasn't the usual kind of girl who came up here to sell gold rings whenever she was in trouble. Does your husband know that you're here? The pawnbroker's son asked her. Yes. Is he a drinker or is he a gambler? The son had seen desperate women here before, and the stories were always the same. Neither, she said in a stern voice, as if to warn him not to ask any more questions. 175 yen, the broker said. 200. And Sanja could feel the warm, smooth metal in her palm. Hansu would have held firm to his price. And the broker protested, how do I know if I can sell it? Father, the older son said, smiling, you'd be helping a little mother from home. The broker's desk was made of an unfamiliar wood, a rich, dark brown color with a teardrop-shaped whorl size of a child's hand. And she counted three teardrop pearls on the surface. When she had gone to collect mushrooms with Hansu, there had been innumerable types of trees. The musty smell of wet leaves on the forest carpet, the baskets filled to bursting with mushrooms, the sharp pain of lying with him. And these memories would always be with her. And she had to get rid of him and to stop this endless recollection of the one person she wished to forget. And Sanja took a deep breath, and kyung -hee was wringing her hands. Sir, we understand if you don't want to buy this, Sanja said quietly. And the pawnbroker held up his hand, signaling her to wait. And he went to the back room where he kept his cash box. Thank you. So where's the karaoke machine? Uh, that was a beautiful reading. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the Ten Mint Museum for setting this up, and also uh, thank Min for inviting me here. Um, we we actually met, I think, my first week on the job many years ago, and um, it's been such a when magical. When you were sixteen, yeah. When, back when I was wearing diapers. Um, <laughs> But it, it's been a real pleasure to get to know how uh, graceful and like what a really deep person uh, you are. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I also want to just thank Ken uh, because I don't know if you've seen my website, but I have like 100 events. <laughs> and I'm really, really lucky to get all of them. But for each one, I get to choose who I talk with. And I really wanted to talk to Ken. And I really wanted to do this event here. And I wanted these communities to meet. 
because I think that the Tenement Museum is the original immigrant museum, and I think the Asian American Writers Workshop really embodies an immigrant ethos. And it's so important to me because I actually I studied at the Asian American Writers Workshop. And the other thing that you should all know is that I'm a huge fan of Ken Chen's poetry. <laughs> so if you ever get a chance to read Juvenalia, it won the Yale Younger Prize. It's pretty deep. <laughs> and it's absolutely wonderful. So I get to talk with Ken, who's an artist and who's also an administrator of this very, very important cultural institution. So thank you for being here. Yeah, just to say like one or two lines about the Asian American Writers Workshop. Um, I guess we believe that you don't have to be Asian American to care about the writings of immigrant South Asian, Arab, and Muslim communities. Um, we've done a lot of things that you might not expect, like we flew 50 writers and artists to the Arizona border for a week to uh, witness the immigration atrocities there. Right now we have fellowships for um, writers who are first generation, uh, writers who originally write in an Asian language. Um, we also have a Muslim communities fellowship, um, and I actually spent all day interviewing people for a job to specifically uh, do programs in Muslim, South Asian, Arab communities. Um, and we also have a billion events. Um, so if you're into Gino Diaz, Teju Cole, Salman Rushdie, Jhumpa Lahiri, these are all writers that we featured. Um, and I guess we try to be a home for the immigrant imagination, so it's a pleasure to be here at the Tenement Museum. Um, so uh, I guess maybe to start talking about Pachinko, um, the official part of the, uh, <laughs> the evening. Um, I think anyone reading it is, would be really impressed by how epic the novel is. And oh. it, I, I really feel like you created this whole world, um, especially in a time when I feel like the trend in a lot of literary fiction is to write these very voice-driven um, first-person novels, which is something I, I know I've heard you talk a lot about in terms of your preference to the kind of omniscient, third-person, Victorian mode. And um, I think what struck me about Pachinko is how much more it's like life and how much more it's like the world, where you're not confined by the charisma of a really beautiful literary voice. Uh, something could happen at any moment, like a character could suddenly die or you know, the entire world could fall apart and go to war. Um, I, I find myself thinking about this essay that uh, Henry James wrote, um, one of the prefaces, I think, to Roderick Hudson, where he said the first task of a novelist is you have to figure out if you have like a lasso, um, where, what's inside your novel and what's not in your novel. You know? And I feel like you could have had so many different versions of this novel. Um, the whole book could have just been Sanjo's story or could have just been the more contemporary um, story of the kind of third generation. Um, I, I wonder, I know you've gone through a lot of different drafts and like versions of thinking about this. I, I wonder what was that process like? And also, I know you did a ton of research, but what was that first moment where you like had an image in your head where you thought, you know, this thing, I, I don't quite know what it is, but I'm, I'm very curious about it. And I see this character, I don't know who she is, but uh, I want to explore that person and get to know them. Like what was that inspirational point? And how did you know what, what that, end of the novel, the end of the world was. Oh. The, I don't know if that's too much. <laughs> Why not, right? <laughs> we just started. <laughs> um, the inspiration for the novel and finishing the novel are totally Yeah, I, I figured totally different. So. Because we, we're talking about 28 years. So I started the book, I, I got the idea that I would write something in 1989 when I was one. <laughs> I was really a precocious young person. <laughs> no, in 1989, I was a junior in college, and I was a history major. I attended um, a lecture kind of like this, but with like two people. And I was kind of roped into going, and I was just being polite, so I went. And it was an American missionary who came by, and he was talking about the Korean-Japanese community in Japan. And he, he's, a, he's a white American missionary, Protestant. And I guess like I had my back up a little bit, kind of like, oh, you know, this is colonialism, I don't know, cultural capitalism. I still like, I kind of listened. And he told us this really, really tragic history of the Korean Japanese, and I didn't know anything about it. So if you guys didn't know anything about the Korean Japanese history, it's not your fault, it's not taught. So I listened to that, and then at one point, I was kind of tuning out, and then he told me this one story. And he said that one of his parishioners, a 13-year-old boy, had climbed up to the top of an apartment building, and then he jumped off to his death. And his parents were just absolutely shocked 
So they went through all of his things and they found a middle school yearbook because he had just graduated from middle school. And in the middle school yearbook, his Japanese classmates had written, go back to where you belong, die, 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 and I hate you. And his parents were born in Japan and the little boy was born in Japan. And because I wasn't born in America and I'm a naturalized American citizen, I think I was in shock because all my life, I'm this kid from Elmhurst, Queens, who had nothing but support and love from all of my teachers, all of our neighbors. I mean, it wasn't a perfect childhood, but it was certainly like I didn't have my classmates telling me to die. And that story stayed in my brain, I think, for a really long time. And when I quit being an attorney in 1995, we're both, by the way, ex-attorneys. Don't so hold is, it against so, us. I know. So is my sister and my other sister, ba my baby sister over here. <laughs> we're all ex-attorneys. Um, we're still trying to be decent human beings. <laughs> actually, I li actually, I like lawyers. Never mind. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> another story. But <laughs> I... Uh, that story really changed me. So when I quit being an attorney in 1995, I wrote one book and that was terrible. And then I wrote another book about the Korean Japanese community and I thought that was gonna be really, really good. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. And I didn't send it out because I was, I just couldn't handle any more rejections. Like I had so many rejections. Like I have a binder in my office because I'm totally masochistic. Like, in case I ever get an attitude, I can just look at that binder and go, you're not all that. <laughs> um, and that binder, just I just couldn't handle any more of it. So then I finally um, read V.S. Naipaul, which is what you do when you give up. <laughs> I read A House for Mr. Biswas, and after I read A House for Mr. Biswas, a very, very beautiful, beautiful book, even though I know he's kind of crazy and a racist and a sexist. But the beautiful novel. Uh, and that gave me the courage to write about people from Queens. And I said, I'm gonna write about people from Queens. They're just as important as anything else. I'm not gonna try to imitate being something I'm not. And that became Free for Millionaires. And then my husband told me that he's gonna to move to Japan. And I didn't wanna get a new husband. <laughs> so we went together. <laughs> And then when I went to Japan, I actually interviewed a ton of Korean Japanese people. And that's when I realized why my second book, which was the former iteration of Pachinko, was terrible. And it's because I had written kind of like a victim's rights manifesto. And it was not a novel. Like, I wouldn't make you guys read the book. It would just be mean. You mean it was too, um, like, the, the you, you're really empathetic to the plight of the Korean diaspora in Japan. But then in doing so, you rob them of their own agency. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And I think what was really interesting to me was I'm a very progressive person. So I kind of thought that if a group is suffering and there was a lot of legal reasons why they suffer, because the laws are so completely crazy, like they lost their citizenship. The laws actually prevent them from getting social security benefits. The laws actually did not let them get payments after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I mean, could you imagine? Just because they're ethnically by blood Korean. I mean, the, I mean, the laws were so completely insane. And then I think I felt so angry. So then I wrote this entire manuscript and none of it was wrong. I think the history is actually totally correct. But it wasn't a novel. Like, it wasn't a story about the human heart and how complex people are. These people are actually really complicated. And when I met them, I realized that um, Korean Americans are like Labrador retrievers. And the Korean Japanese are like Great Danes. Can you <laughs> to the non non dog? Yeah, where for the non dog the, people. The, no. <laughs> the non dog people. I think the Korean Americans, because for the most part we have been accepted in this country, and for the most part, it's not perfect. For the most part, we've been able to get employment, rise up in the world, and there's a lot of like wonderful, wonderful things about America. In Japan, because they've been denied it for over 100 years, and even today, they can't actually be seen as fully human. I mean, today, that they're really defended. They're very noble and defended. And that's a very different thing than the, a dog that's like really friendly, like, 
I'm very open to hugging somebody or saying I love you. Like all those things are very American. <laughs> Not very Korean, very Korean American. And I think that's what I really learned when I met the Korean Japanese. And I met dozens upon dozens upon, upon dozens of them. And it took me a long time to break through the community because you had to keep getting a green light from somebody else. Like you had to say, she's safe. She's not gonna mess with you. And then I would be able to meet people from North Korea who are North Korean identified Japanese. And that's the toughest community to like really meet. Yeah, I feel like um, particularly the last third of the book where you really, where that, something similar to that your book scene happens, um, you really get the sense of um, the Korean Japanese diaspora as this sort of um, what it means to be a colonial subject in Japan still, you know, and uh, and the shadow on those passages is like thinking about being Korean American or Asian American here and how different it is and how you know uh, people can have the same parents or grandparents, but being in these different um, like state or national regimes really changes how how you racialize yourself, how other people see you, what names people call you, um, and then you tie it up where you have like Asian Americans like kind of intersect the story um, at the end. Um, so I, I thought that was really interesting about how same and how different um, it all was. Um, well, it's very funny because the Asian American tent is huge yeah. in America, but it's kind of like doesn't exist anywhere else. Like if you go to Indonesia, a person from Indonesia does not think that a person from Japan and a person from Indonesia have anything in common. Yeah. Like, so for example, like the c concept of Latino. Like you ask any person from Puerto Rico, what do you think about a person from El Salvador? And they'll be thinking, it's another country. Why would you think that we have something in common? So I found that to be really interesting because people would say terrible things about the Japanese to me, thinking that somehow I would take consolation in this. And I thought, no, that's ridiculous. Like in the same way, like I don't take any comfort or consolation when people attack other minorities. Like I don't feel better. But they thought that it was a safe space because they thought that I was kind of like a natural enemy of this group. And that's. On Team Korea. I'm a Team Korea. I am kind of on Team Korea. <laughs> but I'm more also like Team Queens. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like, um, you know, like when you're Asian American, you're racialized within this specific national context that mm -hmm. has its own history you know, uh, that has to do with like slavery and, you know, destroying indigenous communities. And so we fit in that context, but um, that's not a context that pe someone in Jakarta, you know, has a relationship with. Um, though there has been a lot of stuff, obviously, about like, what is Asia, you know, like Asia versus the West in the colonial time. Um, but I, I, I feel like those stories are really interesting where you were kind of trying to meet these um, Korean Japanese people and they're kind of like, well, we have the same ethnicity, but they're also kind of trying to figure you out, and they have things that they, they know will play to like the play to the crowd, you know, like oh, don't Japanese people suck? And then you're like, huh? You know, no, know. the like question mark materializes. <laughs> I mean, I I guess I'm curious, like how who did they think you are? Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, did they like the characters in the book actually have a very strong sense of Americans and mm -hmm. Korean Americans? Mm -hmm. Were they instantly like, oh, this is a Korean American, or well, how did they read you? They read me by blood, which is like. So yeah. completely insane. So for example, and this is not to say I'm a nice person, because I'm not, not really. <laughs> so at, at, I, I go to this church in Tokyo. I went to this church in Tokyo. And we used to work for the homeless. And, and what was interesting about the homeless, and I think part of the reason why we did this is not because we're so great, it's but, but because it was just kind of like a way to join this community. So we're doing this public service thing. So my, it was my husband, my son, and I, and we would serve curry to the homeless. And there's a huge, huge Korean, I mean, um, homeless population in Japan made up of Japanese people. And there are no social services for the homeless. Anyway, they got three chefs in the kitchen who were Japanese homeless people to cook for them. And one day, I thought I had this bright idea, and I told some colleagues who were volunteering with me, I think that maybe we should pay them a minimum wage for the three hours, because then they wouldn't have to carry all those cans for at least one day, because they, they basically money, collect money from recycles, recyclable materials. So I said this to this older gentleman who's Japanese, and I was really proposing about maybe $30 that the church had the budget for. And he said to me, it's your Korean blood. 
you're always complaining. This is a totally a Western church. Hmm. You know, it's, it was a Western church. And this gentleman who said this to me, this is what makes life so complicated. He's a really great guy. He's like way nicer than I ever will be. He, he has spent most of his life helping the homeless. But then when it came to the point of me advocating for this person, I mean, for these three guys, and for them to make $30 a day for those three hours, it was like, it wasn't even about the argument. It was an ad hominem attack yeah. about my blood. And I thought, whoa. And I had nothing zippy to say. You know, like when you kind of want to have that zippy thing to say, and you're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, it, it, it was such a weird ad hominem attack for you that yeah. it like confused you that you, you couldn't just be like, that's racist. You had to be like, my blood. <laughs> and I was like, oh, oh, that's right. I'm Korean. And that's what he's going to read me as. Like, I was legible in a Korean blood way. And it, it happened again at um, our landlord. There was a leak from the toilet and then the water was coming down. And they, when they finally fixed it. I contacted the landlord, and I thought I was being a nice person. I said, I think you have to dry it properly, otherwise you can get mold. Because I'm the kind of person who reads way too many articles and worries too much. <laughs> but it's his building. Again, he said, you Koreans are always complaining. And I thought to myself, but if I didn't stay home an extra day to let you dry out that thing, then your building would suffer. Well, in, in to translate it into the American mm -hmm. context, where in, in Korea, the, it, you, it's not the same as being Korean American. It was like you were like an uppity. Yeah, person. I was an uppity Korean who yeah. was living in a, a subsidized apartment that my husband's company paid for. Like we could never afford to live there unless the company paid for it. And I think that he really resented it. But again, th the hardest thing for me always is when you have people attacking your group is I'm 48. And I have met a lot of people, and I don't like just sign people off because of one remark. Because we all mess up, right? And I kind of think people will give me the pass if I mess up. However, it was so hard because a lot of these people are perfectly nice in other contexts. And that's like the hardest thing about dealing with racism, sex, all these isms, is because you're like, ugh, generally you're a pretty good person. <laughs> But you're too late to change. Like, I just don't think I can school you on this one. <laughs> uh, well, I, I was curious about this thing of blood, because it, it, it is something that comes up throughout the book. And, um, and th there's a scene kind of like what you're just describing, um, where one of the characters on his, I think, 18th birthday, before his birthday party, has to go get fingerprinted. Yeah, 14th birthday. Say, 14th birthday. And, um, and then they complain, and then the, um, the state officer says, you're just complaining. You, all the Koreans say that. But the person speaking is like the Japanese girlfriend. Um, but in terms of blood, like, I, I feel like it intersects. So like, right in America, we've had different regimes of race, where sometimes it is about things like blood and biology, like phrenology, like what, what is the size of your skull. Other times, it's about culture, like the Moynihan report that said that you know, black or Latino families are pathologically like unable to succeed. Uh, like bell curve, like the Charles, bell curve. Yeah, yeah. And the bell curve has an interesting mix of that because the bell curve. Do you, do you all know what the bell curve is? Um, so uh, it's a book written by Charles Murray 20 years ago, I think, that um, uh, said that people of color were genetically inferior to white people. And with Asians, I think it actually says something kind of interesting, which is it says. Asians also have lower IQs than white people, but because of the magic of Confucian culture, they get higher SAT scores. So it's this <laughs> deployment of like biology and cultural, cultural and biological racism. And magic. Um, and magic. And magic. But in terms of blood, I, I feel like um, it connects to something that is very thematic in the book, which is what is a family? Um, and uh, there's a way where in the book your family is sort of like a kind of fate that you are connected to. Can you escape it? Can you not escape it? Um, I, I was actually thinking about something that uh, Yumna, my wife, and I were talking about um, when we got married, which is, I, I think especially coming from an immigrant family, you're very used to this idea that um, a family is something that you are born into, something that it, like, you're here and it extends backwards. It's, it's an inheritance. But Yumna was saying, maybe a family is something you create, like something that you have some agency in generating forward. And I feel like um, there are characters in your book who feel really 
uh, cursed, literally, by mm -hmm. their family and by their blood. And they have this very um, haunted sense of what it means to be part of a family. While on the other hand, some of the most um, like emotional family bonds are often with people who like are kind of not like technically in the same family, or they're sort of accidentally together. They got married in a kind of haphazard way, or they they're like a couple that's not married yet. And it's always about like, is family literally your blood, or is it the people that you've chosen to create a home with? Um, I think that. Um be being an American, I always think Americans in general have a much more expansive definition of family than almost any other country I've ever traveled to in the world. And it's always a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful to think, to think that you could choose your friends and your family and create almost a familiar kind of bond. And the other thing that I really noticed when I was interviewing a lot of working class and poor people and the people who have histories of working class and poor families is just how important family and your clan is. And whether you call it a clan, like in Ireland, or whether you call it a family, is because the institutions around you will not protect you in a legal way, you have to trust your family. So there's a kind of almost uh, a tribal aspect to it. And I have to tell you, I'm very tribal. I am. Like, if once we're in, we're in. Like, we're going to have to fall and die together. <laughs> and I think that comes from my background in Elmhurst. Like, I was thinking a lot about the Tenement Museum. My sisters and I, we did not grow up in a formal tenement. But my first apartment, when we first came in 1976, we were living in a, a one-bedroom furnished, really disgusting apartment with, like, a shag rug and carpets and mice and roaches and... Um, and this is what I really remember growing up. And I kind of think the reason why I always think about it, and I'm very clear that that's where I come from, and that's where I came from, is because I think it's very easy to forget. And people focus, especially lately, so much about today and things are really great. But when I think back, my, when, if I meet somebody from Queens, or if I meet somebody from the Bronx where I went to high school, it's very quick. Like, there's a kind of understanding that comes incredibly fast. If I meet somebody from Staten Island, I get you. Like, if I, if you meet, if I meet somebody from um, a poor part of the Bronx, like, I really understand. And my husband's always amazed at how I can switch my code. Because I, I'll talk differently. Because I could talk yell if you want me to. But I can also talk as if I understand that you have a, a different set of circumstances than I do. And I think that was really important for me to write this book because I wanted to really write about the, the poor. It's really important to me. I think most of the world is actually poor. And this is the origin, to, to live in places that you don't want to live in, to not have good conditions. Yeah, I, I feel like um, one of the things that really struck me about the book is I feel like it's one of the best books I've ever read about um, gender and economy, oh, or what you. it means to be a woman and a worker. And, um, and as, as you could see from the passage that you read. And um, I found myself thinking about, um, we did this event with the novelist Madeleine Thien, who wrote um, this book uh, that was a finalist for the Booker, and uh, Jia Yang Fan, who's a New Yorker writer. And they were both talking about growing up in very poor families. Mm -hmm. We started all talking about Elena Ferrante and how everyone loves Elena Ferrante. But when you read all these reviews, ha does everyone know who Elena Ferrante is? Um, so she's an Italian woman writer writing under a pseudonym who wrote these books about um, being poor in Italy that are incredible. Um, but what we were talking about, when you read a lot of the reviews, they tend to flatten her work where it's about like female friendship or becoming a writer. Um, but when you read it, and if you've been from an immigrant family or if you've been poor, it's very clear it's about being absolutely poor. And like the second book is all about actually being in like a factory and working. And I was struck by how much the book is about what it means to work and what it means to be a woman. And you know, there are characters who literally sell their bodies. There are a lot of pl plot moments that are about um, women trying to figure out how they're going to pay the rent or pay the pawnbroker, or pay a loan. Um, there's a part at the end of the book where some of the characters are talking and they just say, a woman's life is suffering. But at the same time, the women have a lot of agency in terms of earning more than the men. The men are always threatened and they're like, that would actually save our lives, but you can't do that because I would look bad because I'd earn less than you. 
Um, but I, I thought that you did so much there in terms of managing all of these different class issues. And, and in a time where I feel like a lot of books are like, uh, you know, a privileged writer in Brooklyn, like, how, will, will he get published in The New Yorker? You know, like that's the plot. Um, I mean, did, did you always know this was going to be uh, like about class? Um, and how w did you come back to your own upbringing? Um, w w there must have been a lot that came out in the interviews. Um, how, how were you thinking about these issues? Um, I think this whole idea of class is so incredibly important to me. And money is really important to me. I always feel like that's one of the funniest things about living in America. People actually pretend like money doesn't matter, but everybody is really worried about money constantly. Um, and in this book, I really wanted to talk about actually the dynamics of how men and women interact when they're oppressed minorities in question of money. So for example, the point that you mentioned, I am dealing very seriously in critiquing masculinity in this book. And by that, I'm critiquing masculinity for an oppressed minority. So if the structure outside and above do not allow men to be men according to their definition of that nation, how do the men behave? And I wanted to be really sympathetic to the fact that these men were not allowed to have legal jobs. They were not given regular employment. They were actually prohibited from being given regular employment. So then how would their women see these men? How would their sons see their fathers? How would their daughters see their fathers? Because they couldn't provide for them materially. And I think that in my like naive anthropology mode, cross-culturally and universally, men want to be good providers. So if that society prevents you legally from doing this, then how do you function? So every single one of my male characters takes on the question, how will I be a man? So one man might say, I'm going to study, and I'm going to be an excellent scholar, and I'll be respected. Another might say, I'm going to make a ton of money, and that'll make me a man. Another man will be thinking, I'll be a great patriot, and that'll make me a man. So it could be philosophical, it could be um, educational, it could be just economic. But it was very important for me to understand the dynamic between men and women and families and the question of masculinity and femininity if you are an oppressed minority. And I think that's a question that all of us have to deal with all the time, like whether it's in America with the underclass or in the history of slavery, you certainly see it. And any time you have an oppressed minority throughout the world, you have this question of how will the men be men? And how will the women be women? And sometimes the women make more money because women are taking more humiliating positions. And it, it does mean that they earn income. Also in America, women also are seen as less physically threatening, and therefore they can work in the home. And that's another way they earn money. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the, the male characters, they, they can sometimes do reprehensible things or they, they have a lot of toxic masculinity, but you are also very sympathetic to them where they're often really trying their best or they're, they're boxed in and it doesn't seem like they have any choices. Um, yeah, I really, I, I saw it over and over in my interviews, just how much the women were like, he's such a good person and they won't give him a job, and he's really upset. How could he not be upset? And I, the women were so sympathetic to the men, and the men were much more like, they couldn't articulate it because they weren't allowed to, because the other part of masculinity is silence. They're not allowed to actually talk about these things. And I felt, I was trying to figure out how am I gonna put this in drama, and that's one of the things that I'm really working with in this book. Um, one male character in particular, uh, Hansu, mm -hmm. he's the uh, sort of Yakuza, shadow character who's in the back of the book, um, who is very well-dressed, he has a lot of money, he's, he's very threatening and charismatic. I, I kind of felt like there was something, I, I don't know if I'm just projecting, but I kind of felt like you relished writing him. Oh, yeah, he's uh, fun. He's he, fun. I, I posted a photo. Very sexy. He has like one of the best uh, <laughs> like threats that I've ever seen in a novel, where he confronts these like, um, teenagers and is basically like, I will destroy you. But over like a paragraph. Um, but he's also very sexy and debonair. I mean, what was it like to write him? And uh, was he based on anyone you interviewed? Um, did, you, did you have fun being this uh, very sexy, like, possibly very evil person. Yeah, I think he is sexy and he's evil and he's very, very masculine. And one of the things that's interesting to me as a person from an Asian country who's lived in Asia for a long time is 
just how many Asian men are totally sexy and hot and very macho. And I think in Asian American media, the images are always so different. So I, I felt that it was really incumbent upon me to tell the truth about the fact that there are, all these, there are these guys whose attitude is, I'm gonna just take care of it, and they take care of it. But you don't really know how, and it could be criminal. <laughs> but you know, you make the call, and it's done. And it, I met people like this. I have to tell you, I don't know if you wanna marry people like this, <laughs> or date anybody like this. <laughs> May not be a great idea. Uh, but one of the things that I did notice is that when I did interview all these alpha male Asian men from Asia, who are in these kinds of situations. And I did interview a guy who was in the criminal world. That was interesting. Um, they're very binary. Everything's black and white. Like you're in or out. Like you make a mistake, you're done. Like you are, you cannot make a mistake with some of these people because their attitude is, I am a single-minded, focused person. And I will get what I need to get. And my word is bond. However, you cross me and I told you not to cross me, it's over. And in my world, as a novelist, everything's gray. Like, like, I believe in like 50 chances. So I was like, oh. So it was very scary for me. So I knew that I couldn't be in an intimate relationship with any of these people because huh. when I interview people, I become very close to people because I spend so much time with them. And I did find that to be the scariest part about the really alpha males. Because you would be more amoral and they would be like, are you screwing with me? Um, no, because... I think I'm really like a softy. So that that yeah. razor's edge part. Right. So like let's say you're the tough guy and I'm your friend and I'm the softy and I introduce you to Linda, right? And I say, "Oh, you know, like Linda, you know, she really means well, you know, can you get her a job?" And you give Linda a job, right? And all of a sudden Linda's like, "I can't come in because my daughter has a problem. And then I break her legs. Kinda, or, 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 or attitudes like- Not in real life. <laughs> but you're Anyone from the Yakuza here, so we're not, just don't kill us, please. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> that is Linda. <laughs> so then, but what, what would be funny is that maybe Linda has a really good reason. She wants to take care of her daughter, but your attitude is, no, she's supposed to be at work at 9 a.m. I'm running a business. I don't care about Linda's daughter. So that's like what I saw over and over again because I would be like, oh, Linda's daughter needs help. Of course, why not? And then of course, like I'd pitch in or something. Yeah. That doesn't happen. So, um, so there, there's this like Yakuza ideology in the book. There's this like ideology of capitalism and like the Japanese state. Um, and there's another ideology that I don't think you'll also see that much in contemporary or Asian American fiction, which is Christianity. And uh, there's a character, Isak, who is like literally the sacrificial son and kind of like the opposite of uh, Hansu in terms of being like a, the, the kind of like the other way of being like a, not an alpha male, like, like a sickly, emasculated, effete, intellectual type. Um, and uh, what you're describing this world as this binary world where you're like strong or you're weak. And it, there, there's a way where the Christianity uh, it, it's the other part of that binary, maybe. It's, it's about a sort of weak morality, but at the same time, people are doing things that are kind of virtuous sacrifices, like in the case of Isak. Um, but they're also, um, like maybe Yakuza people, plagued by a certain type of shame, often through Christianity, um, where they, they feel like they're, they're a dirty person, um, or they didn't do something that was moral. Um, I was wondering, uh, how you wanted to write in these characters who were ministers or who, um, you know, were censoring their own thoughts because it seemed unchristian. Um, was that something that happened that you learned about through all these interviews and that initial mission missionary that you met? Um, what, what were you thinking about when you were writing these scenes? My theory about Korean people who write about other Korean people who don't ever address Christianity is I think they don't know Koreans. Like, if you know Koreans, you know that Christianity plays in the community. So it's almost like if you read the 19th century novel, you will always have a parson yeah. or a vicar, like, because it's part of the community. So it's almost like if you know English people in the 19th century, there's a vicar, there's a parson, somebody messed up. <laughs> and for me, because I only write about Korean people, I think Koreans are really interesting. <laughs> 
I really want to address the question of Christianity. And you really can't understand Korean history in the 19th century and the 20th century without understanding the role of the missionary. It's impossible. Like, whether you, whatever your feelings are about religion, like, you would not have the education of women without Christians in Korea. The Yi dynasty absolutely did not believe that girls should be educated. Missionaries did. So if you look at the, all the universities, the major universities in Korea, they were pretty much started by missionaries. The other thing that Christianity did for um, the 20th century Korean is that during the colonial era, the chief architects of overcoming and overthrowing the Japanese were Presbyterian ministers who came out of a seminary in Pyongyang. So, you know, a little known fact, uh, apparently uh, Kim Il-sung's mother was a Christian. So, because in Pyongyang, that's where all the Protestantism really was, like, the, that was the hotbed. And these were the guys in 1919 who led the march. It was just like the civil rights movement. It was led by Christians. So, whatever your feelings are about you like religion or not, or Christianity or not, is that it has a very strong political and identity force in the history of Korea. And then the other thing is that I think interpersonally, it is so important for so many Koreans and Korean Americans. And in Japan, Christianity is seen as a cult today. Like you tell somebody that you go to church and they're like, oh, that's so charming. Are you in a cult? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's very, it's very like that. And they're very educated people. They're not actually ignorant people saying this. It's very elite people believing that Christianity is a cult. I mean, you could be Episcopalian and they think you're in a cult, which I think is kind of funny because Episcopalians and Presbyterians, they have no feelings left. So <laughs> yeah, I, I speak as a Presbyterian. <laughs> so that was the other thing that was really interesting. And, uh, I, I guess in the book, you will see different kinds of Christians. You're going to see bad Christians, and you're going to see good Christians, because I think Christians like Asian Americans or Jews or Germans or any of those people. It's a, it's a big tent, and people are complicated. Yeah, I love that in the book there's so many different characters that there's no one who's ever representative, which is great. Um, and I, I was thinking um, our friend Shinhee, who's here, uh, like almost a decade ago, I think she was like, oh, you know, do you really want to get to know the Korean American community in New York? Have you ever visited Redeemer Church? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think maybe uh, I see it's getting dark outside. And it might be time to answer questions from the audience. Um, oh, we and we point. have prizes. We have prizes. Yeah. That's why I brought Very my Very hygienic, bag. stylish prizes. Yeah. So my girlfriend, she owns this company, and she makes these phone cleaners. I'm not kidding you. Phone cleaners. They're so cool. They're so cool. She makes these phone cleaners for high-end companies like the Four Seasons in Hong Kong. And she made a whole bunch with Pachinko written on it. Oh. Look, here. Um, how, how many of you could use a, a hygienic screen? Uh, so the reason why the reason why I wanted to give these out today is because I actually don't have that many, and I was saving it for a special crowd. Um, and also, in Pachinko, when you play, you win you win prizes. So I thought it'd be kind of fun. So if you guys have. Um, Thoughts from the audience? I, I get, have I like ask... seven to give away. Oh, right, right here. So you're only eligible to get the prize if you speak into the microphone that Jennifer will bring. Right. I love the point you made about uh, <laughs> Kim Il Sung because it's been said that one of the reasons singing is such a big part of North Pro Korean propaganda is what Kim Il Sung saw in churches as a child. And realized uh, the hypnotic power of mm -hmm. song. Speaking of North Korea, for those Zionichi. Koreans in Japan who chose North Korean passports, even if they were from Jeju Island or wherever, did they feel or did they say to you when you met them that they felt under special scrutiny when anything like the abductions issue came up in Japan? Did they feel especially targeted because they were associated with North Korea versus the South? They are especially targeted, and they have said it. And right now, there are right-wing um, Japanese people who actually throw stones at kindergarten children who go to those schools. And you could look this up in the Japan Times. And it's really tragic, but it actually happens today. Um, right now, I'm glad you asked this question. What's your name? Sean. Sean, here, hang on. Good catch. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually going to clean a Blackberry with 
Whatever floats your boat, Sean. <laughs> I don't judge. <laughs> um, the reason why Sean's question is so important is because today, if you are ethnically Korean, you have three choices. You are either a North Korean identified person, pardon me, I'm throwing things. Um, you are a North Korean identified person, and by that I mean you don't have a passport, you can't travel. You have a little card because North Korea and Japan do not have a diplomatic relationship. And then you also have uh, a South Korean passport, that's the other kind of person, and you're affiliated with the Mindan. And the Mindan person is the majority of the ethnic Koreans. And the other choice is that you can become a Japanese naturalized citizen. However, no one will ever think you are Japanese. Like most people might say, oh, Minjin, she's that American writer. Yes, obviously I look Korean, but I think no one here would actually dis dispute the fact that I'm an American citizen if I showed you my passport. In Japan today, you could become a naturalized Japanese citizen and no one will think you're Japanese, even if you're four generations in. Other thoughts in the back over there? I can't throw that far. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the really distinct elements of Pachinko, as discussed, is that, uh, you know, that epic aspect of it. And um, kind of as Ken Chen was saying, you know, I think it is so different from contemporary fiction that, like, did you at some point make the decision that it was going to be distinct in that regard? And also, what books or writers um, influenced you to write in that direction? Uh, what's your name? Hannah, sorry. Okay, Han Hannah gets a prize. Okay, I'm gonna be like Donahue. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, this this crowd actually knows Donahue. That's good, uh, <laughs> because th there've been crowds that are like. I know. Yeah, it's it, it's too late. I'm 48. Oh, um, so Hannah's question is really great because I am a really weird writer. I write essentially 19th century type novels, but but written with a modern sentence. So my obsession is to really, really try to write the large social novel of ideas and politics, much in the vein because I'm completely insane and perhaps like, I guess the best way to look at it is ambitious, the worst way to look at it is arrogant, I don't know, it doesn't, depending upon the day, I really wanna write in the kind of book like George Eliot. That's who I really want to write like. However, her sentences today wouldn't fly. So I studied John Updike and Joan Didion, William Trevor, Alice Munro, and those are the sentences I wanted to write. However, I did not want to write in their points of view because the large community novel requires community voices written by a third person omniscient narrator in the past tense. So like, that's a very, very different thing than most novels today, which are in present tense. Present tense makes me nervous, <laughs> and I just can't do it. I like reading present tense. I like first person. I like third person limited. We can talk about this all day long. I could talk. I love second person too. However, you know, that's not the thing that really calls to me. And I think the reason why this is is because English is not my first language, and. I learned how to read, write, and speak pretty much in the public libraries of New York. Um, and I read all the books that were on the shelves. And those books that were on the shelves that really spoke to me, probably in middle school was probably Charles Dickens, and in high school it became like Sinclair Lewis, Edith Wharton, um, and it became much more European as I got older. So those are the books that really influenced me, and they're the ones that I really dream of. Um, Charles Dickens and George Eliot pop up a lot mm -hmm. in this book, and I've heard you say a lot uh, this idea that you write a like Victorian novel with a modern sentence. I wonder, in terms of like plotting, what do you have any advice for people to who want to write social novels or write more dynamic plot-oriented work that that has that wide world in it? Um, like, what what does it mean to write? What does it mean to write a kind of old-fashioned Victorian novel in in a modern time in in a craft kind of way? Well. I think that the reason why the omniscient is so interesting to me is that I want to understand the dynamic between Ken and Min 
and Linda and Hannah and Sean. Like at any point, I would like to know what is Sean's plot line and Hannah's plot line, and how do they interact with Linda's plot line and Alan's plot line. They all become really relevant, and actually within this room, I'm sure we all have so many different things that we care about. And they could collide, and they could not collide, but we're all interested in surviving in New York City. Not easy. I, I, right? I think one thing <laughs> that surprised me is that there's so many, the, the world keeps getting bigger. And like mm -hmm. even late in the book, the next chapter will have like a totally different main character, or a new character will pop up. And I think maybe being trained by like the contemporary, more psychological novel that's smaller in scope, I kept expecting the world to become um, endogamous and like shrink. And the new character is actually like the cousin of the person you met already. Oh, this new person who's walking in, who's involved with the Pachinko business, it's actually the main character you were following before. Mm -hmm. But that never happens. and because it feels like you're in the real world, which is actually a very large place with lots of people doing lots of different things. And that gave it both a sense of like fatalism, but also a sense of like freedom in that y you never felt like you were suffocating within the, the narrow like milieu. Um, you know what I always think about Seinfeld? I know, it's totally related, I promise. <laughs> yeah, I... Like, if you watch Seinfeld, um, it is awesome for about 22 minutes. But if it was 23, you'd die. Because it, it's claustrophobic. Yeah, it, you're just like, I can't handle 23 minutes. But 22, it's like, genius. <laughs> so I kind of think there's certain kinds of stories that you want to have in a certain way. But if you wanted to write a community novel, it's got to go, you got to go big or you got to go home. Like, you just got to go big. And the themes are connected. Like what I just said, in this room, we're all trying to make it in New York City. That's pretty, I mean, we are all connected in that. Like we're all trying to figure out like, how are we going to get home? Like, are the trains going to be running? <laughs> Other thoughts from the audience? Uh, right here. Uh, we, do you want to wait for the mic? Otherwise, you can't get a thing. <laughs> Thank you. In terms of your process, do you have all your various plot lines planned out before? Do the characters evolve? Do your choices change? Like, I don't want to, no spoiler alert, but Solomon's choice at the end. So do these change, perhaps, as you go, or do you have it all fixed before you start the actual writing? Because there are so many different plot lines. Um, yeah, it, it just about killed me. But, and actually, I'm glad you asked that question. Your name is? Ruth. Ruth. I'm glad Ruth asked me that question, because uh, Ken asked it, too, but then I somehow, like, flubbed it. So I get to revisit and fix it. I do outline, but I have, I don't know if this is advice, because I don't like to give advice, because I always feel like I haven't like earned it. But if I want to share my process, my process would be that I do outline a lot, but I'm not that attached to outlines. So I believe in like getting the cheapest possible notebook, like throwaway pens almost. And kind of like scribbling and trying not to judge. Because if I make it really precious, then I think I get really self-conscious. So I'm a big believer in doodling, sketching, not calling attention to what I'm doing. Because it gives me a kind of freedom to keep making stuff. So I really believe in making stuff. And I, I'm also really, really like gentle with myself when I'm making stuff. Because it's the part of me that is um, very vulnerable. So I try really hard. And whenever I talk to somebody and they're working on something, I'm incredibly gentle with that person because I know how hard it is to face that page or the screen and to keep going. And the other weird thing that I believe in is I believe that we're infinite, but our time is finite, which means that you can throw away a lot of things and you can come up with more. So in a way, your creativity is your friend, and it's not going to let you down. So I don't believe in writer's block. But I do believe that your time is limited, which means that we have to make choices about who we see, what we do, and how we spend our time. But in terms of creativity, I kind of think, make your outlines if that works for you. But if it doesn't work for you, what does she know? It took her 30 years. I mean, you know? <laughs> uh, right here. Oh, uh, Mike? Hi, my name is Mike. 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 <laughs> there was this look of recognition when I said Mike. Um, I 
wanted to go back to what you said about Japan today. If you went to Japan as a Korean American who was working for Goldman Sachs. Yes. And you got transferred to I know people like that. Yeah. Okay, you got transferred to Tokyo. Are you saying even today in a sophisticated environment like that, you would be treated poorly? The Korean American who's been transferred so Japan. you could be a very wealthy Korean American person who works at a company like Goldman Sachs. And you can walk around in your expatriate world and pretty much for the most part, people aren't going to um, bother you. Because most likely Goldman Sachs will sign your lease. However, every foreigner has difficulty renting an apartment. But one of the things that I did see is that unfortunately, you can make as much as money as you want. You can speak English as well as you can. You can go to the best schools ever. But they really do see you as Korean. They just, it just, it is. I mean, I was really surprised because I thought that because I'm friendly and I'm hardworking that they would like me. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> that said, my husband is half Japanese. My son is a quarter Japanese. And I think it would be preposterous for us to blame whites today for slavery. Like, it, but it just something, it can always be called out. And I think one of the things that always has outsiders sort of on tenter hooks is you can always call this thing out. You know, like my friends who are Jewish are like, everything can go great, but then sometimes it, it can come up and it's like, oh, that's right. And I think that anxiety is exhausting to live with. So, you know, you could be gay and you, this could happen, or you could be, um, a trans, or I mean, there's like a million things that the majority culture is intolerant of, wherever you are. And I, and I found that to be really hard. So will you be protected from some things with money and status? Sure. But it can always be a factor. And I found that to be really um, eye-opening. I think we'll have time for one more question. Is there uh, in the corner? Here. Uh, do you want to wait for the mic? But your name's not Mike, I think, right? <laughs> My name's Laura. Um, I went to um, one of your colleagues' uh, event last week, I think. It was Katie Kitamura, who said that um, she, she perceived that all rich people or decadent people are rich and decadent in the same way. And so you now said that you're interested in the poor and that you saw the poor in Queens, and you saw the poor in Japan, and I'm just wondering if poverty is different um, in different places in the world, or what do you thought? Oh, um, I don't know if I think rich and decadent are all the same, in, in the, or if, they are, if they're decadent in this. I don't know. Actually, I don't know the statement, so I don't want to take her out of context. But um, I think that the poor are deeply underrepresented in modern literature. And it troubles me, because I actually think most people are poor in the world. Most people are middle class or mostly poor. Like right now, there are 65 million refugees in the world that nobody wants. They're not poor. They're like hanging onto the planet by their fingernails. And I am interested in the lives of these people in the same way I think all of our lives are really interesting. And I think the dynamic between a middle class person and a working class person is also interesting. And I want that community to be in that space. I think also the history of poverty is interesting too. And because, and that's the reason why my first line in the book is history has failed us, but no matter, because history has failed the poor. Because the poor do not leave documents. So it's not because the historians are terrible. Most historians that I know are lovely people, <laughs> incredibly progressive. But they can only work with what they have. So what that means that you could be a working class white guy in England, and your history is incomplete too. So in the Great War, World War I, I mean, so many people's lives are not documented. And we don't know what it was like to leave your mining town, let's say, in um, Manchester and then to come to the war, and then to die undocumented. And I think, and by undocumented, I mean without records for historians. So that is what calls to me. It may not call every writer. And I think that you, because writing is such a weird, I don't even want to say it's a business. Like, it's like such a weird thing that I do, that um, 
I mean, don't you feel like as a poet, like this is such a strange thing? It's not a business. It's it, not a business. It's right? a highly irrational activity. Yeah, it's a highly irrational activity, and it's almost like, I think it's like a compulsion. Like, when people tell me they want to be a writer, I always ask a couple of questions. I always ask, like, oh, what do you read? Because some people just want to be famous. And I'm like, if you want to be famous, this is not the way to go. <laughs> or they kind of think, well, anyway, so then, but if you feel compelled to tell stories, then I think that your training will catch up with you, which was certainly the case for me. It took me such a long time, not because I didn't have stories to tell, but because I didn't know how to tell the stories I wanted to tell. So it took me a really long time to learn how to write a 19th century omniscient point of view. It took me a really long time to try to imitate the sentences that I wanted to have. However, going back to your question about the poor, I wanted to tell the stories of the poor in this technical way. And my next book is going to be similar in that sense. It'll be a different subject matter, but it'll be, I am writing the Koreans trilogy. The Koreans have not asked for this. <laughs> <laughs> they might want their money back, actually. But um, the first one is Free for Millionaires. It's about a poor kid who goes to a fancy school and has to see what the choices of New York, which are so splendid and beautiful and glittering. And the second book is you have Pachinko about the Koreans in Japan and about the genesis of a well-off group that began in very serious poverty. They were living in shanty towns with found materials, with pigs in their houses. And then... The third book is going to be called American Hogwan, and it'll be about the role of education. American Hogwan, and a Hogwan is a cram school. It's a Korean word for cram school. It's kind of like Kumon on speed. And I'm writing about the role of education for Koreans around the world. And after I finish those things, I'm going to go to Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think given uh, that we live in a time where every day there's another crackdown on, Im on immigrants who are often undocumented in a different way, and as income inequality grows wider and wider with each year, it, it's hard to think of a book that is more pressing and timely, even though it documents things that happened decades ago. Um, so uh, I think there's books for sale, and there's also some booze, it seems like. Um, but as a historian, <laughs> History has failed us, but no matter, because we have Pachinko. And, and the, the plot lines that have brought you all here tonight, we're grateful for. And now I'm going to give you your own choice to make a decision of how you want to engage even more in uh, Pachinko. And you can, do it, you can do two of these things, and you can do it in any order you want. Um, first of all, let me thank <laughs> you both for coming for this wonderful conversation. That's it. And let me thank all of you. So the two ways you can dive more deeply into Pachinko, um, you can purchase the book at a 15% discount and have it signed right here. So I encourage you to do that. If you don't buy a book tonight, that's OK. But if I find out that you went to Amazon.com, <laughs> Hansu will come and get you. Um, and so will Peter Twig, who's our book buyer. So please do that. You can um, buy the book. You can get memberships for the museum and help us be able to keep doing programs like this. Um, and I, uh, another way you can get involved, and it's absolutely free, and again, I hope you do both of those, is to expand the multi-sensory experience. And we have a cake that has the cover of Pachinko on it. So you can eat Pachinko. <laughs> and I hope it will bring you much, much good luck. The cake will be served um, right behind me so in a moment this the screen will go up and you'll be able to walk right past and the books are there and I hope you do both so thank you very much for coming tonight and thank you for this wonderful book